Good evening, friends, and welcome. My name is Robert Mealy. I'm the Director of Historical Performance here at the Juilliard School. And it's my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome our old friend William Christie to our midst. It's rather extraordinary to have someone in three dimensions these days, and it kind of marks the turning of a page for us to um, the times when we actually did get to make music together in front of real people. So we're very happy to have this occasion. Bill is a real mentor to our program here at Juilliard. It's thanks to him he planted a seed many years ago, um, which resulted in the idea that Juilliard should have a program of historical performance at the level of excellence that Juilliard represents in all its other fields. And that seed has grown and flourished over the years and has become an extraordinary program. Um, some of the current students you'll hear tonight and I wanted to say that uh, one of the reasons for Bill's visit is also to celebrate the work of Benjamin Sossland, who's our administrative director, who is moving on at the end of this year to other realms. Um, it's thanks to Ben's meticulous and utter professionalism that this program has flourished over the years. Um, and it's thanks to him that we have developed a really close and warm relationship with ensembles like Les Arts Florissons thanks to him that we now have um, a wonderful connection with Bill's summer program in Tire, where many of our students go each summer to work with side by side with the musicians of Les Arts Florissons. So this is a bit of a celebration of the program, a bit of a celebration of William Christie's remarkable artistry, and a celebration of Ben Sosslin's many, many contributions to the Juilliard School. This will be the first of, I think, many celebrations to come. So thank you all, and with that, I welcome you. I welcome our distinguished guest, William Christie, and our first performers. Thank you so much.
it's nice to be able to start out a master class like this having very little to say. Um, and by that I mean to say that what I enjoyed was the entire rendition of this sonata. Um, you're very at ease with the public. Um, this, you're so enthusiastic about this particular piece as well that I'd like to see you sort of d deliver it to a, a several hundred of us rather than the sparse group of enthusiasts here. Um, a few questions. Um, well, first of all, a few good comments. The intonation is, is impeccable, really. I mean, given, and, and that's already saying an awful lot. I think um, the tuning is quite wonderful. Um, and technically, uh, you, you impress me immensely. Uh, and you have a kind of an easiness with the, the uh, gut strum fiddle, which I find extremely re reassuring. Um, bravo, uh, David, as well. I think the duo uh, works well. And this is an important thing to say, because essentially, um, if one finds oneself with a bad Violinist, that's one thing, but if one finds oneself with an accompanist who doesn't quite know how to do what he's doing, that's even worse. And here we've got two people who obviously have worked together and who enjoy working together. And what would I have to say to, in terms of the, the ensemble? Well, um, what I enjoy is your freedom. I'm speaking to the harpsichordist, our friend, Pent David. And um, what would I incite you to do more of? Well, it's very simple. I think that. Uh, you've got to be, already you've got some fantasy and some imagination. Uh, I like your right hand. That's to say your right hand is not simply just sort of, you know, trying to sort of uh, play the chords that are indicated by Mr. Leclerc, but you're actually sort of, I would say, sort of exploring the keyboard in a, in a, in a rather exciting way. Um, we don't have a continual cellist. Um, is that a heresy? Is that something that we have to say, oh, too bad. Um, I'm not sure. I've just done a recording of Senaillé and Leclerc. I, we finished last week, as a matter of fact, with a, a young French violinist. And I did it solo, without, without a, um, a, a boat instrument. But what I think you've got to do, and this it would be, uh, again, a, a, there's a little bit of, of this advice going off to you as well, uh, Joseph, um, be a little bit more extroverted. Um, you've got to, I think, sort of, um, don't, you're not replacing something. You're creating a kind of accompaniment which is different and has to be different than if you were playing with a cello. Um, what would I suggest you do? Well, more of what you're doing. Um, I like the, 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 the tessitura of the right hand. I like moments when we have trills in thirds or in sixths. I like the idea that somehow you can um, be inspired by what Joseph is doing and you can imitate or follow or be a little bit more sort of um, uh, obviously sort of solistic. That's an important thing. Um, don't be afraid of using the resources of the instrument. That's to say two eights, you know. Or with that d delicious uh, tambourin, put the forefoot on, you know, yes. Um, can we, um, do we have to stick to what we see on the page? Uh, um, can be moments where, for example, uh, uh, the harpsichordist can introduce things, play your line? Um, yes. This is music essentially which has no limits in terms of what you can do with it. It invites you essentially to do this. Yeah. Now let's talk about Leclerc a little bit. Um, and then we're going to talk about you and your violin. Um, you're going to tell me about Leclerc. Um, he's not played enough, that we know. Uh, that's a good start. Yeah. Do you like him? Yeah. 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 Um, this, this music is... Uh, sorry? Recorded nearly as much as this particular set, too, I think, is not as recorded. Well, I mean, there, there are, there's a lot of music of Leclerc, which simply is, is going unheard and, and sort of unloved and unplayed. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in the fact that the, it's resolutely Italian in the sense that all the directions are in Italian, aren't they? Really, aside from the fact that there's a tambourin at the end. Um, what does that sort of suggest to you? Um, I mean, he definitely had 
Well, well it, it's, it's just really simply, you know, it's this, it's this extraordinary sort of m a marriage, essentially, of a Frenchman um, who can write Italian music as well as any of the Italians of the 1730s or 40s, essentially, is what it's all about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the interesting thing, too, is that a number of his colleagues, as you know, actually went to Italy and studied. I mean, there's the, the idea of uh, one's always, we've, we've been sort of knocked over with this idea that there's the French style and the Italian style, you know, the goût yeah. français et le goût italien, and the goût réuni. Uh, but the fact is there was far more commerce, and I think in sort of free flow of ideas. And we're here now in Italianate Paris. Yeah. Um, this suggests, I think, something which, it's a manner of playing. Uh, I think if you were asked a Frenchman, a violinist, to, to define what would be the difference between the French style and the Italian style, let's say, if you were, we were back in 1740 or 45 or so, he'd say, well, you know, they're a little bit more robust and sort of, perhaps a bit sort of extroverted than we are. Um, which gives you an idea of how I think um, these pieces should be played. They should be played fully, they should be played uh, obviously to communicate, um, and um, yeah. Now, what's, is there something is there something, is there a residue of French sort of style here? Um, it's the Sarabande, obviously, yeah. Uh, but then again, a Sarabande like this you can find in, in Italian music as well, you know. You can actually find it in, in Vivaldi, you know, you can find it in Handel, certainly, you know. Um, I think that there would be a case where you could do a bit more, have a bit more freedom, you see. Now, the other question I want to ask you is, and this is something which will be a reoccurring question, you probably started out on modern fiddle, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. And you've come here because you want to play baroque fiddle or classical fiddle. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's interesting because this is going out on the air, on the air, it's going out on the social media, and there are people going to be listening to us who are going to say, well, why did he leave the, the modern violin, you know? Um, and why are you here playing an violin that represents for many violinists a number of difficulties and a number of, of enormous differences and changes in technique and, and what have you? Could you talk us a little bit about that? What does this instrument to you represent, physically speaking? Can um, you? I would say physically with the gut string and kind of the responsiveness and the, just the range of the sounds that you're able to really, I guess it just feels much more sort of alive. There's much more variety in sort of the physical texture of it. And then maybe the bow kind of there's a certain um, freedom in the, the shaping, um, I think that it allows. Um, and I guess just the overall experience, really just sort of this um, freedom and flexibility and I like the words you're using, yes. Shaping, freedom, flexibility. Um, there seems to be a kind of a physicality to playing a gut string instrument, which one doesn't really have with a modern bow and a, a, modern, a modern fiddle. Um, yeah. It seems to be almost a kind of an a physical extension of the person who's playing, you know, mm. which one also finds, of course, in woodwind, or, you know, Baroque woodwind players, or what have you. Um, Tell the audience, this, the unknown audience as well, um, what you can do, or what you, can, what you can't do on a modern fiddle, actually. Um, are we talking about things that you can do, as you say, you're using words, shaping, phrasing, uh, what have you. What can't you do on a modern fiddle that you can do with this particular instrument? Oh, um, I'd say modern. Violin bow, you can really sustain the, the sound a lot. Um, but uh, just the, the responsiveness, I think, here on the Baroque violin just allows um, that to happen a lot more kind of naturally. You don't have to sort of force the shape with your. Well, it's a question of phrasing as well. I mean, the, I mean uh, are you saying that in modern technique or modern bows, the, 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 uh, the bow stays on the string, sort of thing? You know? Yeah. What about vibrato? I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing wonderful sound, but then there's not an awful lot of insistent vibrato. Is that something too that you, 
you've been thinking about? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, at this point, like, 18th century, the, definitely there are people vibrating, but, like, my idea is that it's more about um, sort of adding a little bit of extra sort of vibration to some of the longer notes. Yes, sort of for expressivity, when, the, when, when you can apply, when you can use it, yes. Very much the same way that I tell singers, look, you know, uh, insistent vibrato is something which, in a sense, is 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 not quite sort of uh, in keeping with Baroque style. You know, uh, it's, it's 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 inherent. You know, uh, fine tuning, for example, gets messed up if indeed there's too much insistent heavy vibrato. Obviously, um, I can't wait to talk about this with our string quartet people uh, who are coming up. Yeah. Um, yeah, can I hear, uh, this is, uh, again, um, uh, the tambourin is not, a, is not an easy piece. It looks easy, uh, but it's not. Um, I want you to tune up, and then I want to ask um, David to be a little bit more sort of, um, how you say it, um, this is popular music in a sense, um, um, popular art music, but I think it should be played with a little bit more, as the French would call, Panache, you know what that means? Sure. Yeah, a little bit more swagger. Okay. Yeah. Um, my only criticism would be that you're about nine, 99% there, you know. Um, I like your body language. I like, I like to watch you. But I think that in some movements, I think you could be a little bit more sort of demonstrative. You know what that word means, demonstrative? Yeah. 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 The, the, the rhetoric is you're, uh, you're, everything is fine. But I think we want to sort of perhaps let's choose the most the most obvious movement. Uh, now we can start perhaps with the with the continual. Tasto solo is one thing, but we don't have to sit, just simply play one note. We can do all kinds of exciting things, you know. We just won't harmonize that 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 that, that D pedal. But then we get into some pretty high you know some high drinks, you know where the the, the tasto is abandoned, where we have the fourth thing marking, for example, on measure 18. Um, why don't you just show us what you might do in a moment of sort of uh, fantasy? Uh, in the minor section, we'll create the Well, the whole thing. I want to start from the beginning and just make it into a, into a bigger set piece. Make it into something which essentially is a little bit more sort of, what can we call it? Um, we're not going to call it bad taste, no, but we're going to call it something which is a little bit sort of perhaps a little bit. Um, well, just a little bit more exuberant, okay? Just a few minutes. But this, again, this is uh, talking to both of you, you know, yeah. Um, and I think um, of the, the remarks I made to you, David, I think that we can start out with having more sound. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I just need to test the four foot before we commit. Oh. I think we can sort of pretend if it's, you know, okay. yeah. <laughs> Okay? Now, swagger. Okay? Yeah. Um, this music, was, was the word virtuosity used in 17th or 18th century France? Well, of course it was. Yes. Some of this music of Leclerc, or by extension people like Senaillé, is essentially music for virtuoso violin. You know? And that's something that I think is very important. You know? You're an instrument essentially that wants to, you're a show off instrument. You know, um, and um, yeah, I think this is an element of, of, of this is uh, one of the, uh, the 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 ingredients of this particular kind of aesthetic. Yeah. And if we just have two or three more minutes before we want to move. Oh on gosh, we could spend two hours on this piece, really. Yes. We'll just, we'll Here we go. I stop you. Um, it's marked presto, you know. Um, I think presto, if I were an Italian, this would be you know, with, and, and using a lot of them, you know, yeah. exactly. I think it's just essentially, you know, it's 
this is becoming a, a more exterior piece. Um, I wish I could spend more time with both of you, um, but this is an excellent and wonderful way to begin this master class. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, We don't really have enough time, you know, but there's so much to talk about, really. While we're waiting for the, the next uh, group, um, I'd like to say something about my, my experience with string players here at the Juilliard. Um, all the instruments in the historical performance department are excellent. But there's something very moving about uh, the, the, the mentality of violinists who come into this program, who are first-rate modern players, who have, I think, this extraordinary intellectual curiosity to do something with, like our friend Joseph um, on an instrument that's going to require enormous discipline and enormous work. Uh, to find a new way of expressing themselves. Uh, and this is the hallmark, I think, of the, the Juilliard early music program. Uh, we're bringing new understanding to music that actually wants to be understood in this particular way. I'm very proud of all this. Hello. Hello. I'm very happy to see you. Gaia, where are you from? I'm from Los Angeles, California. Very nice. And how long have you been playing Baroque oboe? I have now been playing Baroque oboe for, I guess, this is my fourth year. Very good. And I've been playing Baroque oboe for the last four years. And did you come to the Baroque oboe from the modern oboe? I did, yes. 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 Uh, we, we were talking about that just before you arrived through the door. Yes. And Kevin, you're a student of whom? Peter Sykes and Daniel Sandman and Richard Egar. Well, you're in very good hands. Yes, very good. Yes, yes. I just saw Beatrice last week. Very nice. Thank yes. You. So, I tell you what, why don't we talk a little bit about Telemann? He, he's, he's actually someone whom I'm very, very, very fond of. Um, do you like Telemann? Well, you see, this again is something which I think the great sort of public who's watching us should understand too, that um, we're not playing music that we have to play because our teacher tells us to play it, you know, and because it's in the cursus of, you know, a modern, you know, this or whatever, you know. Um, the people who are coming into this historical performance department have something which I think we could call just unabashed passion in terms of the repertory, and the instruments they're playing. And this, of course, is, I think, one of the most wonderful things about the, what we could call the early music movement. You know? uh, you're here not because you have to be. You know? You're not playing music that you're forced to play just because you're in a, in a, perhaps in an orchestra or in an ensemble where, yes, if you don't like Shostakovich, well, that's too bad. You know? um, you, you're playing essentially what moves you yes, on an instrument that you identify with. Yes. That's very important. Yeah. And that's the thing that I think shines through immediately when we hear people like you. Yeah. Now, Telemann, what is he saying to you? Telemann is, in this piece, weeping and also jubilating, I think. <laughs> and I think it's due, you know, he, this is so exciting to me because I think this piece and a lot of his chapel music um, excerpts kind of bring together like the international stuff. Well, yeah, that's, that's a wonderful word, yeah. This guy is doing exactly what Europe is not doing right now, or the world <laughs> in general. Um, he's essentially, he's a cosmopolitan, pan-European. Um, he can speak French as well as he can speak German. He can speak a little bit of English because he belongs to learned societies, you know, who actually converse in all kinds of languages. He speaks fluent Latin, yes. And he essentially, he's Middle Europa. He's, 
He's assimilated styles that come from the south, that come from the east, come from the north, whatever, you see. And he can write in these styles. He's prolific. My, our only problem, of course, with him is that he's relatively unknown. He's eclipsed by people who are, well, can we say Bach is better? Yes, I, I suppose we can. But the fact is, we're dealing with someone who's got enormous qualities. Yeah. What are the difficulties for you? Feeling grounded. Uh, and technically speaking, does he like? Does he understand the elbow? He sure does. I oh. understand he was an oboist, so all of this fits really well in the fingers, and it just G minor is my favorite key. <laughs> Good. Not just literally breathe, but the music breathes. Yes. Yeah. Well, of course, the oboe with this an instrument that's really an extension of you, yourself. You can't find a better example, can you, really? Yeah. Exactly. This idea that these instruments were so well known by the, their composers is something terribly important, you know. And the 18th century, I think, is probably one of the best examples of this. You know, the great violinists could compose. And the great oboe players, you know, or, or the, the people who were writing for oboe, for a flute, uh, for bassoon, uh, know the, these instruments incredibly well. It becomes idiomatic. Here we go. Right. And yes, I, we, we won't talk about the, 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 the harpsichord continuo for the moment, but um, afterwards we'll have a few, a few remarks to make about that.
that what I heard is enjoyable and, and lovely. Um, so there's not an awful lot to say. Uh, technically speaking, you, you, you have no problems whatsoever. This is fulfilling what the, the piece wants. Um, I ask myself the question whether it's not just a little bit, again, um, lacking in this kind of, the word comes, it's, it has to do with the two of you, actually. It's a bit, a bit sober. It's a bit sort of, it's a bit sort of cautious. Um, we have a few problems with a simple just realizations of there are some unwanted uh, parallel fifths and parallel octaves. I'll, you know, <laughs> it's from the very beginning. It's actually, it's in measures 15, 16, or 17 that I noticed. Um, I think, too, Kevin, you've got to participate rather than in just listening and accompanying, but being an essential part of the actual fabric that you're trying to create. Um, your, the, your ambitus, you know, the, the, you're using very little of the keyboard. Uh, nothing prevents you from actually sort of participating with a right hand that's going to be a bit more active, you see. Um, there's also something which I've played some of these pieces now for 50 years or 60 years, and maybe it's just because I'm becoming, I'm doing things that I wouldn't have done maybe 40 years ago. But um, think about this music as being essentially, it's tafel music. What does that mean exactly? Are we talking about uh, well, the, the German Gebrauchsmusik? Uh, is this music for enjoyment? Yes, it's pure enjoyment. And it's, uh, where are we playing it? Uh, after a nice meal or before a good meal, uh, in a house somewhere, amongst friends, uh, in a tavern. After all, you know, Bach was spending Sunday afternoons, you know, sort of drinking and making music, you know. Um, um, there's something just a little bit sort of too cautious, I think, about especially the way that the two of you are presenting this. Um, now, the tempi are good, but I think I wouldn't go into a, a, a velocity is not what I think we really, we really need, you know. Um, I think uh, these are suites as well as sonatas, you know. They're, we can give, obviously we can give names to some of these pieces, so they do become suites. Um, dance movements. Um, uh, can we think, for example, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm harking back to what I've done now recently. Can you ask me or Kevin or, uh, uh, to play maybe uh, a few measures of uh, a harpsichord solo where you can, you can sort of take a little rest and, and, and have him sort of, sort of ex yes, why not, you know? Can you use a right hand that's going to be a little bit more sort of adventuresome and sort of actually sort of play more with her? Uh, I'm mentioning this because essentially we're missing something which is important, you know. Um, if we don't have a continual bassoon, if we don't have a continual cellist, you see, um, it's not that I, I, I find that lacking, but it's, it, it's, we have to compensate for that in some way. Uh, the harpsichord sound and the harpsichord participation has to be a bit fuller. The, the, the very beginning, for example, this, it's a beautiful line. The idiom da da dim you know, that has to, there's a there's a uh, there's a, a linear sort of uh, beautiful quality of 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 of, of continual, of, in, in, which I think we need more of. It's to say that perhaps in a in a in a, a, a terser sort of more concise way, it's a bit too dry, frankly, you know. Um, it's got to have the same kind of feeling for the line that you're hearing with Gaia, you see. And there's a little bit too much of, of, of um, you know, it's a bit sort of Berlin East and Berlin West, you know, a, a, a bit, you know. I, I need something which is going to come together more, you see. That's important. Um, the question I asked to your predecessor, Joseph, the violin player, was um, what are you doing with this instrument that you can't do with a modern oboe? Now, I'm not, this is not modern violin and modern oboe bashing, um, by, and by no means. But it's essentially to point out to the people listening to us, 
and watching us, you know that there is a fundamental, very fundamental difference. What is it exactly? You started using words at the beginning, which I found very, very, very poetic. It's because it makes, it makes an extension of your, 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 your own breath, exactly, and your own, your own self, yes. Someone said to me, I remember years ago, I was working with a modern oboe player who then tried to, to convert. It didn't work. But he said, you know, I love my modern oboe, but it's, it's like you know, being at the wheel of an Aston Martin, you know, and I'm on the Autobahn, you know. He was a German player. And it's wonderful, you know. It just gives me this extraordinary sense of being, yes. Well, that's fine, but the instrument's doing too much in a sense, you know, yes. Now, and what else? There, there's suddenly, you're talking about subtleties. Phrasing, yes. Phrasing? Yes. Great uh, contrast of dynamics uh, within that phrasing, and I think because you can play quieter quiets with this instrument, it brings out that big difference that you can make in a phrase. You can play the absolute quietest, that you possibly can, and the absolute loudest that you possibly can, in the same measure, and it sounds like the same instrument at both of those places. Um, can you talk to me about temperament? Yeah. Um, do we know what temperament is? Yes, we do, of course. Temperament, essentially, is, is how notes sort of, sort of um, belong to each other, you know. You know, what, what you know, um, yes. Temperament, we talk about historic temperaments. We talk about uh, yes, uh, and we also talk about pitch, don't we? Yes, two very important things. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't like to be a prisoner in 440 or 4442, uh, having to play uh, Telemann or even more to the point in the French music. You know, yes. I like the idea that I can play or conduct orchestras or, or be with people in chamber groups where we're playing in French low pitch or you know, uh, uh, 415 sort of international sort of mid 18th century sort of standard pitch or even a high time pitch, yeah? And what about your instrument? About temperament and pitch? Well, my instrument is pitched at 415. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I find that with this instrument, I am able to play at a variety of temperaments. Ha <laughs> ha, that's the thing that I want to hear, yes, <laughs> yes. Whereas This is a, a, terribly, no, a terribly important aspect, essentially, of, of, of early music interpretation. I discovered this years ago when singers would say, but gosh, when I hear the oboe, the oboe seems to be, uh, yes, he sort of hugs on to, to me, and I, I, yes, and of course, what the singer was saying, that it was just the opposite. She was singing uh, uh, much better thirds, you know, and... <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually in, 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 in nicer temperament because of the oboe and the flute because it was accompanying it. These are, these are subtleties, but they make for enormous, enormous differences. Because, as you say, a modern oboe is essentially designed to play everything, you know, in, in, in equal temperament, you know. This is not quite what I like to hear in old music, you know, yes. Yeah. Try to put a, a, a modern oboe, you know, in, uh, in, in, with Valotti, you know. Um, the first comment is made, of course, well, the harps goes out of tune. Yeah. Yes. These are important things to be said. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we're just about out of time. Oh! Sorry. <laughs> I have, these are cries of anguish because we're really getting into some wonderful, wonderful moments. Bravo. I, I would like to hear much more of the two of you. Uh, but then again, this is, you know, time goes too, time goes too quickly when one's enjoying oneself.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Isn't it great to hear music? Yeah, God, it's... Very efficient stage crew. Ladies, we, once you've tuned, we will go through the entire quartet, okay, without stopping. Great. So we'll do the two movements of Mozart and then go right into the first movement of Beethoven? Or uh, well, no, I think we'd better, we'd better, we'd better stop after okay. Mozart, okay?
There, really. Uh, I wanted, uh, can we, uh, this is very moving for me to hear this piece. Um, first of all, bravo. Um, the, um, <laughs> a couple of questions before we get into it. How long have you been together playing? A little over a year. A little over a year, yeah. And that's, you, you see each other frequently. Yeah. yeah. This is something which, of course, is indispensable and, and very reassuring. Yeah, exactly. One can't play quartets if one doesn't spend a lot of time working together. Um, I, um, I want to sort of just spend five minutes t talk, uh, giving you two little anecdotes. I come from Buffalo, New York, and I don't know whether you know about Buffalo and string quartets, but it's, uh, well, there was an enormous amount of money laid down many, many years ago by a very rich man to, to essentially bring Beethoven quartets every year to Buffalo. Uh, and then it's, it's been going on now for 75 years, which meant that Buffalonians who went to, you know, listen to music had a, a steady and large dose of, of quartets played every year by every, every quartet you could possibly imagine. I grew up with the Budapest, because my parents were friends with Misha. Um, and I developed a kind of, um, how would I say this politely, a kind of a, a repugnance for essentially the kind of sound I was hearing. It seemed that every quartet that came to Buffalo played in exactly the same manner. Exactly the same manner. And of course, we were talking about quartets on modern instruments. Years later, I was in Amsterdam, and I heard someone who you probably might have heard or known, perhaps you, Anna Bilsma, uh, playing with Lucia van Dahl. And they were doing, essentially, Beethoven and Haydn quartets. And it wasn't fabulously beautiful, but it was fabulously beautiful because all of a sudden I had a kind of an epiphany. You know what that word means. So the, 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 there was a moment when I was struck by something that I'd never heard before. Sounds that, that made sense, instruments that didn't sound forced and, and overplayed, um, um, a naturalness essentially to the writing that I had never ever experienced before. And it had 100% to do with gut string instruments and people who were playing essentially with some idea of historical correctness. This, is, I think, is one of the most important things to say to the, the, the public who are listening and watching us. That for me, he represented, of course, one of the most extraordinary phenomena in, in middle and late, uh, late 18th century music, the, the string quartet. Um, and I think that if there's been a contribution to a new sound, a new awareness, and simply just a new appreciation of this form, it's with people like you. It's the early music group of people who are essentially giving themselves a very hard time indeed playing gut string instruments with, 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 with historical bows, you know. Um, this gives me such enormous pleasure to be able to say, you know, because essentially I think you're rejuvenating, and I think the word is right, you're giving new youth to music that was simply just driven into the ground, you know, brutalized, you know, and it still is, you know, by modern quartet string players, you know. Uh, there's, I can't listen to modern instruments played any longer. This is something I, I say not fr proudly, it's just simply, it's that, you know, we've, 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 we've taken music that can't withstand, essentially, modern string technique. Um, I hope you agree with me. <laughs> Obviously, you do. Um, um, but let's, let's talk about the piece now. Um, I think the, the beginning of this, La Dissonance. Oh, by the way, why do you call yourselves um, the Quartet Salonnière? Can someone explain that to me? Okay. Don't be bashful. <laughs> Yes. As a string quartet playing in homes, it's kind of a more natural setting. 
Yes. So uh, the the it derives from the word salon. Yeah. yeah. Which has a kind of a and I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry to say this, a rather ambivalent sort of connotation in, in French. Uh, a salon essentially is a literary uh, group, mostly sponsored by well-to-do people on a regular basis, mostly every week, where we have famous people, for the most part, sort of talking, you know. Do we have musical salon? Yes, we do. Um, I've rarely heard the word salonniere, but I like it very much. It's, it's, uh, Yes. Salonniers were women of higher class who, since they weren't allowed to sort of demonstrate either if they were a musician, um, they were not able to perform in public. Um, so they would perform in their homes, they would commission works, they would hold phil philosophical conversations in their homes, literary conversations, and musical conversations. So our quartet kind of honors the female perspective of the 18th century. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. I, that's a wonderful subject, actually. And of course, it's a subject which is getting an awful lot of press now um, uh, and a lot of attention. You know, um, literary salons with ladies, because there's, that's, you know, you've, you've, you've heard of Madame de Defense, for example, and, 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 and people of that. But um, painting societies, um, musical societies, yes. Uh, the Concert Spirituel in Paris actually had women, and there have been rather, rather well-known women, singers and what have you, yes. Um, yeah. um, let's talk about the piece. Um, this, I, I, I studied this piece actually when I was, you know, when I was a musicology student, uh, because I think there's been more ink spilled uh, <laughs> uh, about this, the, 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 the Adagio than there has been for almost any other piece of Mozart. Uh, I don't think the Mozart Requiem has had enough written about, and uh, is much written about it, but has this, this particular movement of this quartet. Absolutely. And it's curious, I can remember that the criticism, and you know, the rework is, I think, you know, there's something like over 20 revisions to make it correct that start actually at the time of Mozart and go all the way through the 19th century, and they end up actually with, you know, a musicologist of the 20th century saying, well, you know, he's, he was really, he, it was an off day, <laughs> you know, and um, yes, um, we can improve on it, you know. This, of course, was the great sort of argument of this rather extraordinary and very good musicologist by the name of Fetis, whom you know about. You, you probably, you, you know all about the, 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 the genesis of this, uh, this particular this movement in the the criticism that's followed actually since up until now, yeah. Uh, what I find essentially is that you're not really sort of showing off a good thing. Um, you're not nervous, you're playing with great sort of, you know, conviction and, and surety, but I find that first of all the dynamics are just w are a little bit pale, you know, and I think that, yes, I, w I would like to hear the point being proved, you know. And the dynamics that are just, I think, just show it, you know, within, and there's a lot of them. We've got pianos and crescendos and fortes and what have you. And I think that just simply, if you get into the, the subject matter and make it more apparent, it's going to work better. Uh, it sounds just a little bit pale, and I don't think it's pale at all. You know, it sneaks up on us, but it becomes, it, then it, it, gets, it hits us over the head like a sledgehammer, you see. And I think this is something which have, must have to be, yeah. I think the fortes must be more important. I think the crescendis must be it may, may more sort of evident as well. In other words, the palette of dynamics has just got to be enlarged a little bit. Um, this is a great piece, yeah. And it should hurt, but it's totally logical. You know, it's like listening, um, sorry, my, my mask is pulling down above <laughs> my nose. Um, We've been involved with Gesualdo, the, my, uh, my ensemble, and currently now uh, my associate is recording the complete works. And I can remember it was, yes, fine, we knew that the Stravinsky was interested in him, and you know, and the dissonant writing, you know, uh, 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 deliberate dissonance, you know. Um, oh, yes, it's, it becomes natural. 
And this is natural. It, it obeys, it's, it, it's not disobeying any, any of the laws of, of good counterpoint. But I think you've got to make it more apparent. Can we hear the beginning once again? With the idea that you're playing it for us. Yes. And the idea, I think that, that Mozart was simply thinking about this, that there is an element of shock, a real shock. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in, a, in, in a bad vantage point here because I'm not hearing as, as, as much as I'd like to hear. But uh, yes, no, no less than that. Because, yeah. Can we talk now about something which is the crucial thing for me? Um, you've all come from, I suppose, modern instruments. Yes? Were you a modern cello player? Yes. Yes, and you were, you were a modern viola player? Sorry, where's the viola? Yes, where? Uh, yeah. yeah, but I mean, and you, you, oh, you were modern fiddle players as well. Yeah. And you have, were you playing this repertory when, uh, it, were, were you, when you were modern students? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, tell our audience exactly what you're feeling now with a different instrument and what you, essentially, what you can do, which you couldn't do before. And I want you to hone in on something which is very important for me, which is essentially vibrato. Um, it's extraordinarily wonderful for me to hear violinists who just use their bow arm a little bit more and, 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 and work sound rather than just you know, covering it up with, with, with vibrato. This is a particularly good example. What happens if we, if we start playing with continuous heavy vibrato? We're losing something, obviously. Can you, t can you talk to me about that a little bit? Sure. So, uh, personally, um, vibrato is the first thing when you start playing guru violin, you just have to cut it off uh, immediately just so you can get used to that because it is a habit that we learn uh, for our whole lives. Yes. And we have to learn to use it differently and choose where we're going to use it, how we're going to use it, what is the intention behind it why you're using it. So it becomes, a big, a big, as a, in, in, in vocal technique, it becomes a, a way of warming a sound up, or perhaps even as an ornament, you know, or as a, yes, but yeah, not... Yeah, and, and still using it as an expressive tool, just as we would if we were playing modern, but just using it with a slightly different intention behind it. Um, modern violin, uh, you know, having a continuous vibrato is a technique that we work on. Um, not having a stop in the vibrato at all. Um, and that's an ideal thing if you're able to do that. In Baroque, um, we start out with a warm, pure sound, and then you choose where you want to add the extra, really special uh, vibrato. Um, not the same kind of vibrato either that you would use on modern violin. Um, so it, it, it opens the sound, it makes it um, an expressive moment, um, but it has to be in the right spaces, it has to have the right intention. It just, there's a lot more thought, you know, not to say if you're a modern violinist that you're not putting thought into your vibrato, but uh, it's just a different kind of process. Well, the problem, of course, with continuous vibrato is that with four people, using that particular safety. We, we have that phenomenon of chords that are no longer stable, where harmonic and, and intervals essentially don't really sound as they should, you know, uh, because there's a fluctuation of pitch, essentially, you know. Absolutely, yes. that's something we work on a lot together, tuning, since um, we really try to tune in six comma mean tone, which means that we, we definitely tune to our open string. So regardless of yes. where the, you know, where the pitch is, um, we move with the chord progression. Yes. And so that's something that we've developed over this last year working together. And it's, it definitely opens up opportunities for hearing harmonies in a different way. That oh, totally. Yes. Very special. Totally. 
And you know, by extension, the trio sonatas, which of course precede you know, the great quartet sort of epoch, is the same thing. You know, uh, to hear uh, a, a marvelous Vivaldi or, or, or Handel trio sonata uh, for bass and two fiddles, in two, two trebles, when with, with this, these kinds of considerations, you know, uh, makes the piece totally and utterly different. And by extension as well, you know, I mean, I work a lot with, with, with large choral pieces, vocal pieces, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Because dosing vibrato amongst singers is just as important as it is with string players, you know. It's, yes, yeah, that's very important. Um, what else can you tell me in, in terms of the, the difference between a modern uh, Quartet, string quartet, and your 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 old instrument. What else is it? What else does this help? The oh, uh, I mean, definitely. I, I think that the beginning of this piece is a perfect example of um, the differences between hearing this piece on gut strings versus modern strings. Um, I think the color is what you described in in your story earlier. Um, the color is very special, and to be able to use this. Uh, to bring out these dissonances in the beginning of this piece, I think it's a special sound that you can't really get out of a modern steel E string. Yes. Um, that, yeah, I would say it's, it's a different timbre uh, for sure. Yes. The timbre and color, I think, is what it's all about. This is very noticeable in the way you're playing, yes. That yeah. this, yes. This, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a more difficult, it's a challenge, this as well. Uh, it's, oh, yeah. it's a much easier thing to do than to have uh, four, uh, you know, s s metal strung, you know, uh, instruments you know, with, with modern bows, yes. Yes. Very much so, yeah. Yes, very much so. Can we hear this once again? Um, this is, I think it, this is, of course, one of the most extraordinary moments in, in Mozart writing. Um, I think it's good to get it into our ears. This is very important. And then, do we have enough time then to, to simply to go on and uh, and do the uh, the allegro once again? Uh, we're, we're quite short on time, though, actually. Oh! oh, oh, oh. By the way, when you play this, do you play the repeats? Yeah, that's really very important. Yeah, because we could have we had some lovely talking as well. I don't know whether you've read some of the texts about sort of uh, extemporaneous ornamentation and and. Uh, uh, well, just spontaneous playing in Mozart, you know, improvisation. It does exist. And there's some marvelous bits. I mean, Zaslaw has written about, uh, about this, Neil, um, in the symphonies, you know, the, the minuet writing, you know, where uh, you can think of, of all kinds of, of, of wonderful ideas about sort of, you know, redoing, doing repeats, you know. Um, I think in, in some of the quartets, it's, it's very much the same thing. Do we have enough time to hear just the first, the first movement? We, we have, yes, go ahead, go for it. Okay, now play it for us.
Yes, it's, it's again, I think that the, the, the most salient sort of thing that I could require here is just simple, just uh, uh, dynamics which are just a little bit more sort of exaggerated, especially the spot sound of piano. Yeah, very beautiful. Um, I'd love to hear more. I'd love to hear, yes, this has been a, a lovely afternoon for me, just because it's, it's gone from soup to nuts and we've had nothing but beautiful performances. Thank you very much. And I'd like to say one thing. That this is a rather sad moment for me uh, here at the Juilliard because it's the last uh, uh, century, uh, um, well, I say collaboration with my colleague Ben Sossland, who for 10 years now has led this, and brilliantly well, this now 10-year-old uh, historical performance uh, department. I'm going to miss you terribly. Um, I think that the, the quality that I've been listening to, in a sense, has something to do with you. Um, it's nice for me to be able to say to the big public at large that there's still, I think, a buzz about the early music classes here at the Juilliard School. Uh, I've used so many of you now in Europe, and. Uh, and it's been an extraordinary collaboration for me, my ensemble, and the Juilliard as well, to have this kind of talent uh, to come to, to work with in, in, in New York, and then to <laughs> invite them and use this extraordinary talent in Europe. Uh, um, thank you, Ben. Thank you. Um, <laughs> And I would just simply say that I came to New York this time essentially as a kind of, um, well, to honor your departure and with the great hopes, of course, that uh, while we have Robert with us to, to, to man the ship, uh, that we have a replacement very soon, you know, and as talented as you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you ladies. Yes, there's, there's, I would love to have a debate over. Oh, yeah. Yes. Are you going to come to Europe one of these years again? Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so what I meant before is that I actually play violin. That's yes. What I meant. Yeah. So I well, you know, I, I'll tell you, you know,